Hey Joshua, do you have the um, email address for your colleague? If you could post it in the chat, then we can send him the link. Like a new okay. link. Yes. I think we have them on screen, uh, John. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Have? Yeah, we have two Joshuas now, so I think we're okay. Oh, great. <laughs> All righty. Well, it is uh, 1 30, so I suppose we'll kick off now. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, ACRD, the Alberta Flagler Regional District Board of Directors meeting for May 25th, 2022. Uh, it is a hybrid meeting today. So that means that we have uh, attendees from the board who are online as well as uh, attendees from the board who are in person. And so I will list those folks off. But before I do so, I'd just like to recognize we're conducting our business today on the territories of the Kupachis and the Tishot First Nations principally in the Alberni Valley. Um, but also since we're coming to you live from Zoom as well, we're all over New Channels and potentially Coast Salish territory too. With that, um, since we are conducting a hybrid meeting online, uh, if there are folks in the gallery, I believe the only person in the gallery uh, physically is someone who's giving a presentation. Uh, we do have a question period at the end of the meeting. Uh, if you are attending online or just viewing online and have a question that could be um, uh, answered, you would have to send it at, uh, to responses at acrd.bc.ca. And that is the way in which we usually go about doing that online. And we'll check at the end of the day on whether or not there are any questions um, that can be answered in person or later on for follow-up. All right, so in the room today, we have uh, board members, uh, alternate board members and board members. We have uh, uh, Director Deb Haggard. We have Director Cindy Solda, both from the city. And uh, we have Cal Roberts, as well as <laughs> Michelle Cole. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the District of Equal. She's physically here in person, so that's uh, pretty awesome. As well, we have uh, Daniel, Wendy, Mike Erg, uh, Heather in, in, in from the staff. And I think that's it for staff members. Everyone else is attending electronically, I believe. Yes, that looks to be the case. Okay, so with that, let's kick off and go straight to the approval of the agenda. Does anyone have anything that needs to be added to the agenda? Or just move. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Dr. Roberts, seconded by Dr. Cole. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed. Okay, motion carried, great. Okay, do we have any declarations? These are conflicts of interest, perceived conflicts of interest, or gifts exceeding $250 of value. Okay, seeing none for anyone else, I'll probably just um, excuse myself for the Kuwait at group of businesses item. Uh, I'm technically still on the board, um, although I've been shifted to other files in Hawaii, I'm still technically a part of it. So just for that, for our sake, I'll just excuse myself quickly and rely on Dr. McNabb to handle that one. Are there any other items? Seeing none, we'll move on to item four. And that's the adoption of minutes for the board of directors meeting dated May 11th, 2022. Thank you, Director Silva. Any 
Second, thank you, Director Bodner. Does anyone have any um, additions, deletions, corrections? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? A yeah, motion carried, great. All right, and that brings us to petitions, delegations, and presentations. So for those of you who are giving presentations, we normally have a 10 minute limit for the presentation itself, but that doesn't include the um, questions and answers period afterwards, if anyone from the board has any questions. So there can be a conversation afterwards. If you're getting close to the 10 minute mark, I will hold up one or two fingers. That means you have that many minutes left, but if you're done, or if it doesn't look like you're close to being done, it's likely I'll, I'll interrupt you and ask the board if we can continue with the presentation. That rarely happens, but sometimes it does. And uh, so it bears mentioning. Okay, so first up though, is a presentation to a long time uh, service recognition of five years for Amy and Naka. And I'm wondering who on staff do we have? Thank you. Alex. Yeah. Alex, oh, there you are, Alex. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Jack. So Amy, uh, who is with us here on Zoom today, has been working with us for five years now, having previously worked for the city of Abbotsford. Uh, Amy and her husband, Ryan, uh, moved to the Alberni Valley to be close to family and, and to raise their two daughters, uh, Caitlin and Elizabeth, in the community. Uh, in her time with us here at the ACRD, she has provided leadership on a number of planning projects, uh, in, including uh, the regulation of short-term rentals, age-friendly planning, housing needs assessments, and uh, supporting current planning initiatives. Amy is currently the planning team lead on the zoning bylaw review project, and we very much appreciate uh, her professionalism and expertise as we work through that very big project in our department. So thank you, Amy. Uh, we are grateful to work with you, and congratulations on five years. And I think she has her jacket already, so I don't know if she's going to show it off or not, but thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Alex, very much. Uh, yes, uh, my I went for a more comfortable everyday sort of wear uh, hoodie here. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, that's awesome. On behalf of the board, Amy, I'd like to thank you for your service. And, you know, here's to another you know, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a long time, but thank you. <laughs> it's 35 now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think that brings us to the next item on the agenda. And we have uh, Mr. Joshua Dolling, as well as Mr. Vernon Williams Jr. on, on the topic of this Sprout Lake um, potential. So I'm not sure who's starting first. Vernon, is that you? Yes. All right. Please go ahead and speak. Thank through. you for giving us this time and call upon the creator of goodness, light, and love that we can hear each other, cooperate, and do the things that need to be done so that we could all move forward in a good way, in a supportive way. And uh, I usually uh, offer a song, but I'm gonna play this instead. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon. I just want to thank everybody for uh, welcoming us to your circle. 
Um, uh, my colleague uh, Vernon and I, uh, we do a lot of work uh, with uh, communities uh, and individuals who have had loss. And as many of you know, loss is uh, nothing new to the uh, communities that uh, live here in the Valley. Um, the reason I uh, wanted to uh, meet with you today is I'd like to put forth a request uh, for the district uh, and the directors, uh, whoever is responsible, uh, to um, do a name restoration to uh, the lake, uh, which is currently uh, recognized as Sprouts Lake. Um, the reason I'm asking uh, that uh, the name be uh, uh, restored to uh, its original name, Klikut, uh, is because uh, Gilbert Sprout uh, was a colonizer. Uh, and if some of you got the uh, email I sent uh, last week, uh, he wrote uh, several books and articles uh, as an anthropologist and scientist and explorer, uh, where he made observations of Indigenous people and their lands, uh, which uh, his views and the views of the colonizers at the time are not uh, favorable uh, by most uh, today. Uh, so in the spirit of reconciliation, I feel that would be the right uh, move forward. Um, the uh, interest that uh, we have here is we're hoping to uh, help people continue on their healing journeys uh, in the valley, particularly around the lake. Uh, most recently, I was working with uh, youth from all over uh, the island uh, to do some healing uh, related to loss. And our team has been working with survivors of uh, residential schools um, for many years, but uh, more so uh, since uh, last May uh, when the children revealed themselves in Kamloops. Um, in uh, Gilbert Sprout's uh, book, uh, which was published in 1896, I believe, he made uh, a few um, observations, um, many uh, where he re his book is called Scenes of a and Studies of a Savage Life, by the way. Uh, so he made many observations of Indigenous people and uh, referred to them as savages, uh, where he believed that uh, they didn't have ownership of the land. And uh, he recognized that the role of colonial, of, of colonizers was to wipe out uh, indigenous people, uh, was to wipe out their, um, wipe them out, whether that be by removing them from their land, removing them, uh, taking away their language and that sort of thing. Some of you may uh, know the history of um, Mr. Sprout's uh, ships coming and shooting cannons uh, at the Broken Island groups and sending the Shashat uh, this way. Some of you may know the history um, of when he was living uh, in the valley, I believe it was three years, um, where he uh, talked about how to take down Indigenous people. Uh, I could actually give you a quote from uh, one of his, uh, from his book. Um, <laughs> In his book, uh, he says, the men generally have well-set, strong frames, and if they had, pl had pluck and skill, could probably hold on their own in a grapple with Englishmen of the same stature. They want heart, however, for a close struggle and seldom come up after first knockdown. The best place to strike them with the fist is on the throat or on the breast, so as to take away their wind. A blow on the head does them very little harm. So he refers to indigenous people uh, being no, uh, being less of a man and actually equates them to the beasts that they hunt uh, in his uh, book. Uh, in uh, regard to their presence uh, in the land, uh, he refers to people being here no longer than eight years. And he makes reference to the uh, hydroglyphs and petroglyphs uh, in Sprout Lake. Um, and uh, from his book, I'll quote again, um, it's, it's very difficult for a civilized man to form in his mind a correct estimate of the moral condition of a savage. In one part of his character, the savage resembles the lowest members of a civilized community, such as the outcasts in large cities. But another part of his character, inherited through a long succession of moral degradation, unchecked by any surrounding counteracting influences, is unlike anything that can be witnessed even in the most brutalized individual in civilized community. There is a resemblance in many respects closer than one likes to admit 
between the promptings and habits of uncivilized man and those of wild beasts which he hunts. The at savage seems to be the traveler, on a first observation, very like an animal with a superior instinct and the gift of rude speech, regarding him in that light, or at least not quite as a fellow man. Um, as I'd mentioned, the, uh, the mindset of uh, Mr. Sprout and those that colonized this valley um, were not uh, those of people that were coming here uh, to be living side by sand, but side by side, the, the people that occupied these lands. Um, for us to do our healing work, we have to, we have to set good energy uh, and good intention. And knowing this history and have read this book, I find it difficult to move past that. And that is why I'm asking this council uh, to uh, have a discussion and to make a motion uh, to have the name not only recognized uh, in this community, but anywhere that it is printed, uh, whether that be uh, on signs, whether that be with business names, whether that be with um, on maps, that uh, the name be restored. Um, I invite you all to read the book. I can send the link again. Uh, there's uh, some lines in there that will actually probably really shock some of you. I've just taken some of the lighter stuff. I didn't feel some of what uh, some of the stuff that he uh, uh, discussed in his book was appropriate. Um, it, uh, it's quite damaging, uh, to be honest. Um, again, I just want to take you back to the uh, how I mentioned that he made he referenced that um, the people that lived here had only lived here for no more than eight years. And I want to read you this quote out of his book because. Uh, you know, science and most of us today would agree that people have been here for thousands of years. Um, so in Gilbert's book, again, I, I quote, uh, this uh, quote is from uh, page 268 to 269. Uh, no glyphics, traces or records of a past people have been discovered on the coast. The historical value of a native tradition disappears after two generations under a load of grotesque images. These hyperborean savages must be very unimaginative to keep a true record for so long a time. Without a written language, the only rock carving ever seen on this coast is on a high rock on the shores of Sprouts Lake behind Alberni. It is rudely done and apparently not of an old date. There are half a dozen figures intended to represent fishes or birds. No one can say which. The natives of form uh, which is a creator made them. And their general character, these figures correspond to the root paintings sometimes seen on wooden boards amongst the heights on, or on the seal skin buoys that are attached to the whale and halibut harpoons and lances. The meaning of these figures is not understood by the people. And I dare say, if the truth were known, there are nothing but feeble attempts on the part of individual artists to imitate some visible objects which they had strongly in their minds. Again, um, in moving forward and to take a step forward to reconciliation and for uh, my team and I to uh, embark on our healing journey here, I'm requesting that you all uh, join us and uh, start by restoring the name uh, in partnership with the Hoopis Cassett uh, they may choose to have a, a new name, uh, or they may choose to have the the name uh, continue. But uh, yeah, I want to thank you for your time. Um, before any questions, I just um, again I'd ask Vernon to uh, uh, set us again with some good energy. We like to transition energy often with a song. So if you're with us, uh, Vernon, uh, would you mind doing that? This one is a long time ago. We were all connected. We have powerful respect for all living things and each other. And it's calling for that connection back again. Oh, 
Thank you for your presentation. We'll open it up for comments and questions. Uh, Dr. McNabb and then Dr. Haggard. So I, I read this book uh, more or less front to back. It's a little bit of a difficult read, uh, but it's, uh, it, as much as it has um, many disparaging uh, comments, uh, there are uh, certainly matters of interest in the book about the language and the customs of uh, the uh, uh, area First Nations, so uh, that part I was interested in. Uh, one of the issues that exists in trying to change this name is that these territories are disputed lands between the Deshat and the Hupetjesat First Nations. So I would recommend that Chair Jack uh, contact uh, both the Hupetjesat and the Deshat First Nations and see if uh, he can arrange a meeting with them uh, uh, to discuss uh, their wishes and to uh, and to and to move toward respecting their wishes uh, as a collaborative effort uh, with both nations and see if we can come to uh, some some logical uh, meaningful long term decision. So that would be, uh, once we have a little chat here, that would be something that I would move. So I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director McNabb. We'll make sure to come back to uh, your suggestion once everyone has spoken. I see Director Beckett, I've added you to the speakers list. Um, if there's anybody else, please let me know. Next up we have is Director Haggard. Thank you, Chair Jack. I was just gonna ask the staff from the regional board about what is the process of going through a name change for something like this? Or do we know what the process would be? Initially after making that contact with our First Nations partners. Yeah, Daniel, do you wanna take that or someone else? I, um, I wouldn't know actually. So we'd have to do the research on that one. I don't know if Mike might know uh, on the process, but it, it would depend whether or not they're attached to any letters patent. Um, and, um, and so there'd be a, certainly a process with the province that would have to be undertaken, but I have never done a name change. Um, Mike? Yeah, so I don't have any information about the, um, about changing it for the ACRD, but for actually the naming of Sprout Lake, that, that's provincial, so there'd be a process um, and, and any recommendation would have to go to the province and sort of that would be the route to go. Might I suggest you reach out to Queen Charlotte uh, up in uh, Haida Gwaii. Uh, they've just recently, uh, the, the, uh, the board, the, the city has uh, approved a name change and they're going to be pursuing that for Queen Charlotte City uh, to restore the name. Thank you. It, it does seem like the, the province is maybe the quickest route to changing these things, but we do want to make sure that the, the First Nations in the area are, are um, engaged. Uh, next up, we have Directors Beckett and then Director Cote. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I liked Director McNabb's um, thoughts. Uh, if that, in fact, is a motion, I would be happy to second that. And as a bit of an aside, and I hope you don't mind me asking, Vernon, what is the name of the instrument that you were playing? It's absolutely beautiful. And where would one be able to obtain one of those? <laughs> it's a, it's a, a traditional whistle that plays like a flute, and I'm the one that makes them. <laughs> well, we have your email address in our chat now, so you, you may get an email. Okay, yes, you could get a hold of me on there. 
Yeah. And I do make them to trade for money. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Dr. Cote, who has an absolutely beautiful, real background. Please go ahead. You are muted, though. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm coming from Deep Bay uh, at the uh, uh, BIU uh, fishery hatchery. So uh, uh, having an interesting day. Uh, I just want to say through the chair, thank you for this presentation and bringing this to light. Uh, it's very important information to be passed along um, and appreciate it. Uh, I agree with all of the comments that have been made so far and uh, look forward to us doing Moving uh, forward to um, acknowledgement and reconciliation. Uh, so thank you. Dr. Roberts, please go ahead. Yeah, through the chair, thank you. Um, to uh, Joshua, um, was the, and you mentioned in the spirit of reconciliation, the name change, would the name be changed to Klikot? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I would suggest that you uh, meet uh, with uh, Hupa Kasset and uh, Susat and, and ask them if that's what the, na the name that they would uh, want. But uh, my understanding is that Susat came from uh, the up the inlet. Um, but again, I, I just uh, I believe the, the lake already has a name to click out. Um, so yeah, my my first request is to remove Gilbert Sprout's name from any uh, any claim to any lands or or to the lake, uh, for sure. That would be a good start, uh, and to read the book um, again. Those were observations from a colonizer. Uh, the stories that I've been told of the lands from people that have lived and grown up here would be much different, uh, and they would be uh, portrayed in a different light. Um, so yeah. Well, thank you for that. Okay, are there any other comments? Uh, Dr. McNabb, do you want to make a motion? Please go ahead. Yes, so I'd like to move that uh, Chair Jack uh, contact uh, uh, Tashat and who touches the First Nations uh, with regards to uh, uh, possibly changing the name uh, of Pro Lake and, uh, and get their thoughts and recommendations and put them uh, together in the process that might happen moving forward. Thank you. And seconded by Director Beckett. Are there any further comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed. Okay, motion carried. I'd like to thank you for your presentation and thank you for the reference to the book. I'm sure it'd be something that plenty of us will, will take a read. All right, thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, that brings us to the final presentation from uh, Ms. Uh, Monica Alrus uh, in regards to the recycling program for the Aberdeen Valley. So make sure when you stand behind the um, podium, uh, hit the talk button on the item and it'll zoom in on you and everything. Uh, thank you and welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Distinguished members of Alberni Quokot Region District, thank you for allowing me to speak. What I like uh, all of you to do is just think of a brand new transfer station. Um, I like you to just imagine you know what you have, and I know what you have. And from this moment onwards, let's go forward and let's make big green industries. So I want you to think really big, big thoughts. And um, maybe even Canada's biggest industry. What is your asset? Your asset is your port, a train, and a world-class transfer station. Think about that. Now, 
what you would do is you would, I have put here together a board and this board is actually a replica from uh, outside Stockholm, Sweden. And the reason I made this drawing was because they just don't use their own uh, recyclable items. They also take England's in. So saying that, what I'm trying to say to you is think about using Canada's, the whole Canada's, also Hawaii, bringing in from California, maybe even Mexico, and make it all separate green industries. And it's huge. It is tremendous amount of new work and industries. So in the categories here, <coughs> Here is, um, I have to go back. Okay. Okay. Maybe I just stand here and then if you have questions, I can point because it's quite um, straightforward, um, which is you start from this end and it's three lanes. The middle vehicle goes in um, and drives to whatever categories you are putting your recyclable items. And then on the left lane, you go to that side. And then on the right side, you, you put, um, you know, your, your whatever you have. So there is the metal, there is plaster, there is wood. As you can see, there's several kinds of wood, depending how the wood has been treated. There is corrugated cardboard, combustible, hard plastic, spring furniture, uh, impregnated wood, there is also white appliances, freezers and refrigerators, paper packages. Everything has its own category. So let's take from all these categories. You can see there are over 30 of them. So let's just take soft plastic. And soft plastics makes energy to tug tugboats perfect for Port Alberni. It is called hydro work. Refuel the ships as it works, and it saves 10 times more fuel than the old way. All down, uh, melt down and make useful products out of it. So that's one industry. So as you can see in the middle of this, drawing that I have, um, in the middle, the tracks only go. So on the right-hand side of the drawing is, um, is 53, 60 foot containers. And I just go and show you where the ramp is going up so that people can just drive with their vehicle go to that category and just dump it down to the container. So I'm just going to go and, and show you where that is. Here's the ramp, and now it goes up. Here's the trucks. And here's the metal, landfill, plaster, wood, and so on. And then you drive out. So three lanes in, middle grade play always drives to whatever category he or she has to go. 
the right lane goes to say paper, okay, paper then goes from here into the right lane. If it goes to say tires, then you go middle lane can come to the tires with or without rim. I mean, you all go out. And this is the truck side. Trucks come in, take the um, 53 or 60 foot container and leave. So when it's full, it leaves. I hope you could understand. And if not, we might have to repeat this. But what I'm trying to say is that this is how easily you can categorize every single item that, that you have. And from that truck takes it directly to that industry. So uh, wherever it is on the whole island. So the whole island could have a brand new green industry wherever it's most suitable. So we need to do some research for seeing where everything fits. So for example, the batteries, like car batteries, both batteries, MC batteries, small batteries. So battery breaks down to three different chemical elements. And when you rebuild that, actually, it becomes better batteries than the new batteries that you purchased. So an other industry could be, uh, yeah, I had written there that can be burnt, but combustible. So items that go to sort out and be burned, like rubber, carpets with plastic in it, books with hard cover, DVD movies, VHS movies, that goes in one combustible. There's several categories, depending on what material it is. Electronics, that's another industry. And that would go to microwave ovens, computers, TV compute, uh, uh, computer covers, cords, lamps, typewriters, vacuum cleaners, and so on. That's, that's industry number four. And then we say hazarded goods. So hazarded goods, the package has to be intact and, and a visible marking what it is, which every package has. So for example, paint, glue, cosmetics, thinners, cooking oil, oil, mercury, chemicals with bleach, in its spray bottles, and other chemicals. Now, Norway, what they do is they uh, drill holes on a mountain and they make big tunnels, put the hazarded items in the tunnels, and then close it. So that's how they get rid of their hazardous goods. And we have lots of mountains here. And we have a great port here that we can utilize. And if we redo the train system, it can also be utilized. So I understand I just have one minute left. So I just uh, want to say, Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And it's just um, a way of thinking how we can go forward from this moment on. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, um, so we'll open it up for any comments or questions. Does anyone have any comments or questions? No. Uh, Director, oh, Director McNabb, please go ahead. So, uh, I mean, an interesting concept. Uh, I mean, our, the, the design and operation of our uh, recycling and landfill operations are, are really um, mitigated by a lot of different uh, issues. Uh, some of them are, are uh, issues around finding homes for the recycled products. Some of them are around uh, the transferring of goods from, from the truck to the bins, and uh, we've continued uh, continued to move forward on efficient design and operation of the landfill. Uh, the recycling portion is really taking 
a very big lead part in what we're doing. So this, uh, this, this concept from abroad is, is interesting and I hope that uh, you'll leave it with uh, Jenny and, and uh, uh, Paulo and they can have a look at it and see if there's integration that can happen between uh, what we're doing and what we can do because we're certainly not at the end of the rainbow with our recycling. Uh, and in, in my lifetime, I expect to see that we will be into the 80 or 90% uh, of waste being recycled and uh, that we can uh, start leaving the world uh, as we found it when we got here. So uh, thank you for your input. You're welcome. I'd just like to give a little note that the bin that is the where all the recycling goes and that truck takes it to a factory that is doing just controlling what is in that bin. So it's a one step further. And you can also import Hawaii's uh, transfer, uh, same goods, we say if it is metal, for example, and uh, you can even bring it from Mexico because you have your deep sea port. And then it comes, then it doesn't come at all where we are doing it here. It goes automatically into the, um, to the factory. Okay, any further comments or questions? So I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I You're think welcome. there are some conversations that should be had at a provincial level as well about just the um, the amount of recycling that's available to the province, especially given the fact that it doesn't seem like glass recycling is much of a thing. And so there may be opportunities for expanded recycling in such a way that does make sense. And if we are one of the few areas in, in North America that does do recycling in certain materials, then that might open up opportunities for us to do that. Um, Logistics wise, I don't know what that looks like, um, but it does seem like the layout for a recycling center is uh, well thought out. So it's something that maybe folks have already taken photos of and we'll go with that. So on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Thank and, you. Uh, it's always good to have someone who is, has a keen interest in these things. <laughs> thank you very much. I like to be green. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well. With that in mind, I think the next step here is to move into correspondence for information, which is item seven, because there doesn't appear to be any correspondence for action. Would anyone like to pull anything out? I have a few things to say about the uh, Island Corridor Foundation item. There's some iced tea stuff there too. Okay, seeing none, I thought what I'd do is just recognize that the Island Corridor Foundation seems to have uh, come up with their business case for rail service, which seems to be right before the deadline. So that's uh, fortunate. I think what I would like to see though, is maybe have, have some folks take a look at what's there. I'm interested in the Island Corridor Foundation items from the perspective of the relationship between Port Alberni and the rest of this, the rail system, given that we are the West Coast hub in the Alberni Valley area. And the relationship when it comes to bulk transport is something that could be quite significant economically as well. Although that being said, we also have a deep sea port that appears to be being improved over time. So that just doubles down the logistical capacity of our area. I think that's all I'm going to say. I think uh, we all know the arguments for and against the Island Corridor Foundation, unless we want to rehash it. I am interested in what industry might have to say about rail and that sort of thing. And I know it's mentioned in the report in a certain way, but uh, I found it funny that a rail service would need to have a business case, it's not entirely private or wouldn't be considered that much. Um, that's it for me. Uh, if there's no other comments, we can just have a motion to receive the correspondence for information. Uh, thank you, Director Roberts, seconded by Director Cole. Any comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? Yeah, motion carried. Okay, that brings us into item eight, which is request for decisions and bylaws. First item is 8A, updated terms of reference for the Alberni Valley Regional Airport Advisory Committee. I don't know who's handling that, so uh, please go ahead. 
Maybe. Jenny, I think you're up. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. I actually thought Wendy might be speaking to that. Uh, yes, I saw on the uh, agenda that we are uh, looking to amend the terms of reference for the um, airport advisory uh, committees for the Alberni Valley. Um, and we've taken this um, recommendation to the Alberni Valley and Banfield Committee Services, um, and they have reviewed and then recommended that this go to the board for recommendation, which is just to make a minor modification to the terms of reference um, to add a representat uh, representative to the committee from the Sprout Lake Fire Department. Okay, thank you. Uh, would anyone like to entertain a motion? Uh, Dr. Sobel, please go ahead. I'll concur with a request to add the Sprout Lake director. So just a recommended Second. Motion? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cote. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We'll, we'll treat it as the recommended motion, if that's okay. Okay. And uh, any comments? Seeing none. All those in favor? All opposed? Okay. Motion carried. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next item are grant applications for strategic, strategic priorities fund. Go ahead. On, uh, on this one, I know that Amy is available to answer questions. I'm here as well. Uh, Terry's away at training today. Um, so staff had forwarded the three different recommendations on three different categories. Uh, the report identifies the reasoning for each one of the categories. And, um, and so perhaps if there are any questions on each individually, we can take them as they come up. Thank you, Dr. Stu. And then Dr. McNabb. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a question, and it's regarding the, the Long Beach, uh, the airport uh, wastewater septic system replacement and expansion. And I'm just curious if there's been conversations with the District of Tofino, as we've just um, put forward an MOU with Tloquay First Nations and Parks Canada to connect into the system when our wastewater treatment plant will be built, which uh, projected starting this year. Um, and I'm just curious if staff would have, have had conversations with the District of Tofino um, into connecting into that system as opposed to the um, conversations around the septic replacement. Go ahead. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes. So we are, have been working on a Long Beach um, servicing plan. So that looks at both water and wastewater for the Long Beach airport. Um, we actually have gotten that to a fairly relatively complete draft format, but that's actually needs to go to the Cooperative Water Board um, with the Tloquiet and Parks. And so we're waiting to take that to the committee until it goes to the Cooperative Board. Um, and it looks at both the water and the wastewater for Long Beach. And for the wastewater system we currently have, we have a few properties that are connected to um, an old sort of very failing um, sort of community septic system. So a centralized one. And then we have another centralized septic system that the other majority of properties that have sewer are connected to. And so what the, the plan looks at it is it looks at like basically all of the, the build out that we assume will happen, not in detail, but a guess of, you know, the areas that can be uh, built out and what kind of system we need. So we've looked at the long-term option, which would be to connect to the Tofino wastewater plant. Um, but until that's operational, we can put in a community sewer system. But we still need the pipes in the ground to service all of the areas and pump stations to get it. Um, basically, if we're looking at a community um, sewer system, it would be like uh, basically the stepping stone before it goes out to the highway to then go down to Tofino. So if we can't connect to the wastewater system, we would put in the community septic system, which would treat it. And eventually, once the system, the wastewater plant is up and running for Tofino, we would bypass that. But we need, I think, about four pump stations and a network of pipes at the at the at sort of the small end of things. And so we've got McGill Engineering working on a bit of a concept design and cost estimate for that um, because the servicing plan just really lays it out at a very high level and we need some class D cost estimates. So we happen, hope to have those in place in, um, in short order. And when we were looking at projects um, and reviewing all of the options available, the Long Beach Airport really like this is going to be one of the big things. We don't necessarily know what the complete long-term vision and build out is for the airport. We know it's going to happen. So we can deal with the servicing. And we know that there's very limited 
capacity for funding for this. So it's going to be a grant project. Um, water's not in as bad a shape, but wastewater is going to be a big deal for this. And so it's a very um, expensive project. So that's good because the strategic priorities fund is um, projects up to 6 million for the capital portion. And so we thought it was a really good candidate because if it is selected, um, and, and gets funding, that will be excellent because it will probably struggle in other grant streams. But that was the rationale behind that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it does to a certain degree, uh, as you've pointed out, the infrastructure that will be needed one way or the other, those pipes have to get into the ground and, and that the overall concept uh, to deal with the wastewater in the longer term vision is what you'll be looking at uh, taking place. So thank you for that explanation. We'll probably have conversation a, a little bit later uh, around this if we're successful with this grant application. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have directors McNabb and then Cote up next. Uh, so the one I was looking at is in the preamble of uh, Sport Lake Fire Department, uh, $1.8 million. Uh, and I'm just wondering about the logistics of this uh, in a cost-saving effort. I mean, the, the one fire hall was closed uh, to try to reduce the cost. And now we're spending, I mean, an estimate of $1.8 million, and we all know how those goes. It'll be higher than that on uh, on replacement of the hall, and in that wondering, I'm also wondering about uh, uh, Cherry Creek's fire hall and their <laughs> efforts to replace it, and how this fund is connected, non-connected to Cherry Creek. So that's my my main ask. I'm sure somebody else will answer the other. Go ahead. I will, uh, I'll speak to some of it and then ask uh, perhaps if Charlie can speak to some of the elements of the consolidation. But I know that um, the, the investment in the Sprout Lake Fire Hall, um, regardless, need, needs to take place. Uh, so there are, uh, there is the need for the additional bay, there is the need for decontamination areas, um, proper storage, and so, um, and just proper access. The, the building that stands right now has been pieced together uh, over the years, which is functional, but certainly isn't going to meet the long-term needs of, of the community. Uh, so, you know, in, investing in, in the one hall as opposed to the long-term investment over two or three halls is is definitely a long-term savings. I think, regardless, we have to we have to look at, at that investment, and we have a limited window where fire halls are actually uh, qualifying. Now, historically, uh, the reason for the consolidation, I'll hand over to Charlie because I wasn't here for that part. And Charlie, if you could uh, add that dimension, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. Yeah, the, the reason for the consolidation was because if you have a hall, you also have to have the apparatus to outfit the hall. So an engine and a tender and then the manpower to man the hall. And that was the driving reason for closing it. So that being said, if you want to have the savings, the savings in the actual number of apparatus, so another full engine, and then the savings in the manpower. That was the reason. But that being moving the manpower to the number three hall also makes a requirement to be able to support them there and they're, they're running out of room already. Does that answer your question? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I get that, but, uh, it, you know, it just seems like we were looking to save $300,000, first of all, and now we're spending, uh, you know, $2 million. So it, it just, it's kind of at our scale of economy that when, the, when all of this ends, you know, where are we really going to be and what's the firefighting efficiency going to be at? And uh, because taking uh, Faber Fire Hall out of the picture re uh, increases the response time. So, and I've heard that from the people that I know around the lake have lived there for a while. Uh, but my other question is, what about Cherry Creek? And uh, why can't these funds uh, be a value to uh, Cherry Creek Fire Hall? I, I don't have the answer for the one on Cherry Creek, John, sorry. Um, just to, on Sprout Lake, the uh, managing the third hall becomes a real issue 
and the long-term replacement of trucks over the years, I think you're further ahead by going to uh, consolidation there. Yeah. So could anybody else ask that, answer the question with regards to uh, the funds and their uh, Cherry Creek being uh, in the circle? Yeah, I believe Danielle has an answer. Good. So uh, I'll, I'll do my best on that one, John. Uh, my understanding from this one is, is the, the request for Sprout Lake came in a little bit late in the discussion that we had around the um, community investment funds that were distributed and we discussed earlier on in the year. Um, and so Cherry Creek did receive, the board did move to, uh, to issue some funds towards the Cherry Creek Fire Department. At that time, I believe what was debated was um, whether or not Cherry Creek uh, was folded into the ACRD as one of our departments or whether it, it still is uh, its own uh, entity. And right now, the way it's run, it stands as its own entity that has the ability to, to collect funds. Um, but as we know, it's, it's, it's hard to keep it at arm's length. It's sort of one of these rare occurrences uh, that's becoming more and more rare within the province. Versus Sprout Lake is actually one of our departments and it is, falls, does fall under our responsibility. Um, at the time, the estimates that had com come in were not complete. Uh, we've since had time to review the information that the fire chief for Sprout Lake provided. And we do feel that this is a, a better match uh, given the, the details that we've gone through. So at, at this time, um, it, it, we would say that Sprout Lake is, is a, a direct uh, account uh, to the ACRD versus Cherry Creek is still at our side. Thank you for that. Uh, next up we have is uh, Dr. Cote. Thank you for waiting. Uh, thank you. Um, just like to point out that hall number two uh, is not, um, it is still a part of our fire department. We're using it for um, first responders and also for training center. So it is still in the, our, our uh, under our service. And I'd just like to say thank you for our staff for applying for this. Um, this hall did need an expansion. Uh, and if, um, if uh, the directors would review the uh, underwriters uh, last uh, review of the fire departments and the, the last one for Sprout Lake Fire Department. Uh, this is a recommendation going forward. Uh, we support it. Uh, talked with my fire department about it. And I um, just want to say thank you. And I hope that we get this grant. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cote. All right. I would note that. Um, I believe that the application for this, the applications are each tied to separate motions. They're not, they're not together. And um, you were coming in a bit garbled, but we were able to hear you mostly, uh, Director Cote. So from now on, if you keep your video off and just use your audio, it'll probably improve the uh, connection there. Uh, Dr. McNabb, please go ahead. So the, I mean, I don't want to belabor this, but this is a federal grant system, isn't it? Is that what it is? Or is it provincial? I believe the strategic priorities is primarily provincial. Somebody actually answer that conclusively? Because I, I, I'm, I'm really having difficulty with, uh, you know, 2000, folks that pay into the tax system that aren't uh, considered when these grants come around. And I'm speaking of Cherry Creek and the Cherry Creek Fire Department building. Uh, it's, it, you know, with, that, with mutual, automatic mutual aid and all the other things we deal with, um, they're a key component of our response. And especially in the wildfire side of things. So, you know, I, we, I think we need to be very diligent in looking for opportunities to provide uh, grants to our to our those that are within our system, and uh, whether or not that department is run by us or run by by uh, the community, it's still a, a, a key part of what we do, and we need to recognize that. So, I guess that's my blurb on that. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Daniel. So the Strategic Priorities Fund is, is provincial and coordinated through the UBCM. Yeah, they renamed it. Um, okay, Director Haggard, did you have a comment? I was just going to ask, can Chair Creek Fire Hall apply directly to this fund for monies for their hall, or does it have to go through the regional district? Yes, um, unfortunately, Terry's got all, got all the answers, but not here today. Um, yeah, they would have to, we would have to apply and enter into an agreement with the improvement okay. district, is my understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Amy, if you could um, answer that, and then we'll go to Director Bodner. Thank you for waiting, Director Bodner, but we'll go to Amy first. Hi, I can clarify a little bit on that Cherry Creek. They can apply as a community, but we would have to sponsor their application as regional district. So we can apply for them as one of our capital infrastructure options. We just have to open up to them. They are not infrastructure owned by us, so we cannot apply on their behalf. If that answers um, McNabb's question. Yes, it does. That makes me think, why did we do that? Thank you. Okay, um, next up is Director Baldner. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I know I've had some uh, long conversations with uh, Lucas Banton, the fire chief of Cherry Creek District. And from what he has said to me is it's very difficult for him to, to be able to apply for certain grants. And I don't know why, whether that's because he does, they don't belong to the regional district, whether, whether they're just because they're just an improvement district. Uh, I don't know, but I know he's, uh, he, that was what he had, had shared with me that, was, that getting grant funding for the fire hall, Cherry Creek Fire Hall is really a, a hard sell. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amy, do you have your hand up? Is that again, or do you just need to put it down? That's again. Okay, um, please go ahead then. For fire hall grants, there are almost nil. This is the first time with the strategical plan that fire hall infrastructure has been included. The first two in 2015 and 2017 did not include fire hall infrastructure. So I can understand Chief Banton's trouble finding grants. All of our other fire halls have the same problem. Director McNabb. Uh, I need to be excused for a minute. My uh, batteries on my hearing aid just croaked. So I'll be back. <laughs> Dr. Haggard. Would it be possible to ask staff to maybe just call, contact the fire chief at Cherry Creek Hall and have a conversation with them if they would like to put in some kind of application, maybe they could work together or? Go ahead. So we have had meetings with Cherry Creek um, around the last intake of grants as well. Um, we had a discussion around whether or not we would uh, want to explore them coming under the fold of the ACRD. Uh, it's really something that they would have to choose to do um, and choose to embark on rather than us uh, stepping forward. Um, and I think as, as Amy had indicated, we have a number of different fire halls so in, that, that have similar needs. And so in this case, it made more sense for us to tackle uh, Sprout Lake. Hmm. Director Solga, go ahead. Just a quick question. So if Ch Cherry Creek decided to um, come into our folds, is it really costly for Cherry Creek? Like what kind of costs is we're looking at to buy in? So, so there is a, uh, a process that they would have to follow um, in order to come in and, and likely seeing a referendum. Um, or a question according uh, along those lines in order to dissolve the, uh, the improvement district and then come in under the ACRD. Now there's lots that would have to be discussed there because as an improvement district, um, there would be an assessment of, the, of their current assets. We'd need to understand well, where they currently stand in terms of the, uh, the health of the assets uh, that they bring in. Uh, and then you know, we would have to decide whether or not they're collecting sufficient funds 
to cover the costs within that area or whether or not we would have to improve that. Um, and so typically, uh, and I'm not saying that this is the case for Cherry Creek, but typically when we've seen transitions of improvement districts into regional districts or municipalities, uh, there's, it has come with an increase in costs. That's usually directly associated with a different approach on asset management, uh, where different organizations choose to collect um, cash uh, in reserve for certain assets differently than, than other organizations because they have a board as well and will make decisions. So I'm, I'm using that as a broad brush. It could be that I, as staff, we, have, we really don't have those details that they currently have. So it could be they're in excellent shape and there would be no difference in costs. Um, but I would err on the side of caution and say there would likely be an increase in costs. All right. Uh, as interested in as as I am in uh, Cherry Creek and that whole idea of, of joining the ACRD or, or some relation to there. And I don't think that's directly related to this particular issue. So I think uh, what we might want to do is contemplate whether or not we're going to move the motion that's been recommended or do something else. So it seems to me that we can't hold off to bring Cherry Creek in given the amount of process that it would take to do that. It would likely just we'd miss the boat entirely there. So I'm just wondering from a timing perspective that this may be the the thing to do, given uh, given already what Dr. McNabb has stated. So I think it just comes down to whether or not we're going to move anything in and, and vote on it and see where we proceed. Because this is applying for the money. We haven't gotten it yet. So if we don't, then the decisions are more clear, right? So. Um, Director Bodner, I know that you're unmuted. Did you have a comment or no? No, I'm sorry. I, I was just caught up in the conversation. <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure. So, yeah. Uh, Director Cote, would you like to move the recommendation or have some other? Way? I would like to move the recommendation. Okay, so just for Thank everyone's you. edification, the recommendation is that the operating client for regional district board of directors support the application to the capital infrastructure stream of the strategic priorities fund for the Sprout Lake Volunteer Fire Department, Harold Bishop Fire Hall expansion, and direct staff to provide overall grant management for the project, if successful. Thank you, Director Cole, seconding. Any further comments? Uh, Dr. Shannon, you're unmuted, does that matter? Did you have a comment? No, I don't know why I unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Janice, she's secretly unmuting everyone. Okay, uh, with that in mind, all those in favor? All opposed? Okay, motion carried, thank you. All right, so there's there are other items here and we're going at it in, in order, I suppose. The next one has to do with the capital infrastructure stream in regards to the Long Beach Airport wastewater septic system replacement and expansion. I don't know who wants to speak to that, but it looks like Dr. Roberts. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that through the chair. The recommendation that the Alberta Clackwatt Regional District Board of Directors support the application to the capital infrastructure stream of the Strategic Priorities Fund for the Long Beach Airport Wastewater Septic System Replacement and Expansion and direct staff to provide overall grant management for the project if successful. Second. Thank you, Dr. Roberts and Director Cole. Any comments? Seeing no comments, all of those in favor? All opposed? Yeah, motion carried. And then finally, one in regards to the electoral area official community plan updates. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy to move it because I'm a fan of OCPs. We spent a lot of time on ours. So I'll move that the Alberni Platform Regional District Board of Directors support the application to the capacity building stream for the strategic priorities fund for electoral areas official community plan updates and direct staff to provide overall grant management for the project if successful. Great. Thank you for that. And uh, seconded by. Oh, seconded by Director Haggard. So we'll just have the municipalities just force this on the <laughs> electoral areas. And, uh, <laughs> I was going to second it just to, just to have the First Nations in there. Um, okay, if there are any comments, questions, um, do you know if this is one of those instances where we could have VIU students coming in and help as well, or is that too expensive? Typically, uh, if we received a grant, um, making use of students, uh, master's level students is, is a typical practice. 
uh, which creates win-wins, uh, but that would be up to the director uh, at the time if we receive the grant. I'm just not allowed to talk to Mike directly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, that's certainly an option, and we've actually uh, done that on some projects before. So, so just how we would fit it into the work plan. Yeah, it it really looked like it went well with Banfield when it occurred that time. So, okay, with that, um, all those in favor? All opposed? A motion carried. Thank you very much. And then, lastly, we have the West Coast Evacuation Route Plan. So, I think that is uh, Heather. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so we received $62,000 from UBCM to, to develop a West Coast evacuation route plan, and that's for the Banfield and Long Beach electoral areas. Um, the grant was done in partnership with uh, Huea, Uchakosa, Tokwa, and Yukulafat. Um, uh, Kalyan has been selected as the contractor to undertake this project on our behalf. Uh, Kalyan did the Alberni Valley evacuation route plan um, this past year, and it was uh, very successful. And we have a good uh, working relationship with Kalyan. So uh, the recommendation is there to enter into a, a contract with them for 10 months. And I do have to admit that I made a mistake in the uh, resolution. So the words per year should be um, deleted from the resolution. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So in the words per year, yeah, because it's a ten-month term. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, uh, Doctor Steer. Yes, uh, thank you, Heather. And I'm just wondering, with um, with Tolokwe at First Nation uh, not not involved, uh, would would there be an opportunity to have Tolokwe at First Nation involved in those conversations uh, for that evacuation plan? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we've listed um, a number of participants in this project. And so the other First Nations, including Tilokwit, Hesquieta, Housett, um, and then the two uh, districts will be participants in the project. They just don't need to be um, project partners. Dr. Roberts. Yeah, through the chair. Thank you. Thank you for that, Heather. Um, I'm pleased to, uh, to see the uh, the First Nations communities, as well as uh, Area C Long Beach, is included. Um, and I see Bamfield as well is included in that. They're kind of across the water from us, but that's okay. I see Doc <laughs> Director Bethany. At any anyway, rate, I'd like to make that motion that the Alberni Clyquot Regional District Board of Directors support the application to the capital infrastructure. Oh, sorry, that, sorry, wrong one. Um, that the Alberni Clyquot Regional District Board of Directors award West Coast Evacuation Route Plan contract to Cali and Limited in the amount of $60,764.70, excluding GST on a 10 month term commencing June 1st, 2022. And further, that the ACRD Board of Directors authorize the CAO to negotiate and execute the West Coast Evacuation Route Plan contract on behalf of the Regional District. Do we have a seconder? Uh, okay. Director Beckett, <laughs> everyone. Um, okay, that's great to hear. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All opposed? Motion carried. Alrighty, we're getting there guys on that. Uh, next up is the planning matters and I am out of here. Director McNabb, if you kindly take over. Okay, well, give you a chance to demute yourself. Alrighty, so who's going to take this on? I will speak to this one. If that's okay. okay, go ahead. Um, so this is a temporary use permit. Um, the application was advanced uh, by Hawaii First Nations. Um, I just want to note that there, uh, there are Original temporary use permit um, for this property was issued in 2018 and it expired in 2020. Um, and ACRD staff have been working with um, HFN staff to address some um, building permit issues um, that were outstanding as well as working through the process to, uh, to initiate this uh, current temporary use permit application. Um, as this temporary use permit has expired and it's been over, it's been a year since it expired, this is being treated as a new application. Um, there are some new conditions that would be included in, in this temporary use permit if approved by the board. Um, I, I would also note that the building permit um, is complete and can be issued once the temporary use permit is approved. Um, 
um, HFN would like to use this accommodation um, for crews that are currently working on the road, so um, and upgrades, and, and have asked us to expedite this. And I would just uh, I just want to thank Sarah who worked on this and got it done last week really quickly, um, so we could get it to, the, to this board meeting um, as, as the first step. I would also note that um, uh, because of the time the time crunch, the Anfield Advisory Planning Commission is going to uh, meet on this tomorrow. Uh, and, and then we'll bring those recommendations um, back if the board approves this step uh, with any public comments that come back as far as the notification process. Um, I will note that, you know, in the, with this application, there, were, there has been some concerns raised around screening um, and, and the permitting process. So the permits in place, we have everything we need um, from, from the applicants. And the applicants have also indicated that, you know, they're prepared to put up a fence um, and, and have that um, included as part of the temporary use permit. And I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Okay, any questions on this? So the one question I would have, um, sorry, Bob, is why don't we have some kind of a procedure or, or um, notification that comes up before these uh, temporary use permits expire to notify these people that, uh, that the permits are expiring and they need to be on it to uh, renew it before it expires. We do, and, and we have it. We've been working with the uh, with the property owners, um, and just the circumstances is, is the property owners and the applicants didn't get the application in until uh, last week. Okay, Director Beckett. Thank you. Before I make the motion, I have. Uh, um, a question for Mike, and then a couple of comments. Um, Mike, the the zoning it's a little bit um, uh, challenging in, in that that it's split. So the property, from what I can read and understand, uh, there's two zonings. One would allow uh, for residential, and one is commercial that wouldn't allow residential. Um, and then there's the, um, um, the applicant who is a very good neighbor um, and a good commercial partner in our community is also identifying that they might want to put in trailers and RVs on the site. So is that something, uh, the, the trailers and RVs, would that be acceptable? Um, so uh, the, there's a covenant on the property um, that was put on when the, when uh, quite a long time ago a pre, a, by a previous property owner. So the, the front portion of the property is actually zoned park and public use, um, which allows for commercial parking, but also some institutional type uses. And the balance of the property is residential. Um, and you know, way back when, when the property was rezoned with P2, it was intended to be for parking. There was a covenant that was put on um, that, that stipulated no no RVs, no campgrounds. So uh, unless that covenant was removed, um, um, trailers can't be used legally. And, and I've communicated and discussed that with the applicant, and they're aware, and they're, they're okay with proceeding with the temporary use permit the way they submitted it. Okay, so my second part of the comment is that... Um, um, the applicant um, last time around was was given a temporary use permit, I understand, but did not comply um, or follow through with all of the requirements, which is unfortunate because it has created um, uh, a, a bit of a challenge, you know, given that some of the community um, are uh, a little bit uh, leery and, and anxious to see that the temporary use permits are buttoned up to ensure compliance. So I, I just want that out there for the record. Um, having said that, I, I think the, the request is reasonable given the, the project and the, the importance of the project. I think, um, and, and I know that um, by taking it to the next step and going to the APC as well as opening it up to the community, um, we'll also get the feedback that, 
that um, the community would like to share. Um, and then it's important that staff work with the applicant uh, should uh, the APC um, <clears throat> identify that they're prepared to move forward with it. Um, uh, that would be important to create that relationship whereby we can we can uh, satisfy the community. Um, is that a, a reasonable approach, Mike? Um, yes, it is. And I've, I've had uh, some good discussions with the uh, with the director of the uh, economic development branch that um, with Hawaii and and understands. Um, you know, he, he certainly wants to do that. He, he told me this morning that, that he'll put a fence up if that's, that's required. And he's happy to do that um, just to make sure that the screening's in place. Um, and and I, I'd explained that, you know, there's some parking, uh, you know, parking could be provided. That doesn't need to be included in the temporary use permit. And just, um, it's it's already permitted in the zoning. And I know there's some parking issues in that area of Banfield. And, you know, that's a business decision for, for them to make. But uh, so that, you know, that's something that's important to the community. Um, so that can also be discussed at the uh, advisory planning commission, and, and also just for for all of the board's information and in, in the dealing with this, um, you know, really, it's it's the Hawaii that owns this property, and and um, you know, not a private developer, and and you know, you know, I've taken the approach, and staff have taken the approach of sort of um, you know working with another local government uh, in the same way we, we've done on projects with Port Alberni, Defino, and Mikula. So, um, and, it, and it's just working through this. Um, so again, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna go ahead um, and, and uh, with acknowledgement and thanks for the work that staff have done on this. And as I said, uh, knowing that we're moving forward uh, with our APC uh, meeting tomorrow, that the uh, board of directors consider issuing temporary use permit TUP 22006 subject to neighboring properties being notified as per local government act s494 okay we've got a seconder can't see her uh, director Bodner. It's tough to see at the table it's a very small picture on this computer so any other comments with regards to this seeing none see anybody with their hand up at the table uh all in favor anybody opposed looks like it's carried somebody want to rescue director jack Okay, uh, thank you everyone for your patience. And that, from what I understand, brings us to 9.2. And this is an item regarding, I think, rezoning. So, is that Mike? Go ahead. That's me. Um, and I just know this is um, the electoral area directors and Tofino. I'll vote on this one because this uh, this property is in Claycott Sound. Um, and I just, I just want, uh, this is Claycott Wilderness Resort. There's two bylaws for the board to consider. And uh, we just know that all conditions of the zoning have been met. And staff recommends that um, the board proceed with adoption of P1416 and P1417. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Dr. Roberts, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, for that, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to see this going through that the conditions for the rezoning approval have all been met, including the confirmation of support from the house. It, um, and I'm sure that uh, Tofino is quite happy, uh, Tom, uh, with, res with regards to parking. The, the, the corporation has actually purchased the off street parking requirement, um, and uh, they've met all of the wastewater. The, the setbacks, 30 meter setbacks from the Bedwell River, and uh, and of course meeting all technical uh, requirements for that. So, with that, um, I'd like to make the recommendation that the bylaw P1416 
Regional District of Albany Clyquad Zoning Text Amendment Bylaw be adopted. Do we have a secondary? Thank you, Director Steer. Okay, any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? A motion carried. And secondly, that bylaw P1417, Regional District of Albany Clyquad Zoning Atlas Amendment Bylaw be adopted. Thank you, Director. Uh, seconded by Director Steer. Comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? Okay, motion carried. Thank you. All righty. That brings us to reports 10.1. Would anyone like to pull anything out in regards to staff reports? I had a comment in regards to July. Do we want to contemplate doing a board meeting away from the Alberti Valley at some point in the future? Impose upon the West Coast? I don't know. <laughs> but let's just have a conversation about that later and, and see where people are available. Dr. Shannon, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just looking at the meeting schedule for June, um, were we having an EA director's meeting coming up or no? I don't see it on here, but I asked because we had mentioned it in our agriculture development committee meeting there, there might be one coming up soon. I can speak to that. Yes, we're planning one um, towards the end of June. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments? We have a motion to receive the reports. Thank you, Director Cole, seconded by Director McNabb. Uh, all those in favor? All opposed? And motion carried. Great. There are no committee reports. That brings us to member reports. 10.3A, um, starting with 911 Corporation. M. So I don't have a, a report because we haven't had a meeting that's coming up very shortly, uh, but somebody has tagged on something else on there. So maybe they, Heather could take that and we'll fly with. Yeah, please go ahead, Heather, if you don't mind. Looks like it's the evacuation exercise from April 24th. I don't know if that is you. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Uh, sorry, I was sort of half listening, but I'm not sure okay. what it is. I, go ahead. I, so, uh, I, I, I don't think it was something I was supposed to report on, but, but maybe I can fake it. I, I, I think just as, as a note of public interest, the fact that th there, there were some uh, two downtimes, and, and typically uh, we don't see downtime with 911 calls, but there were uh, two different downtimes. And so the corporation made a point of reporting out, uh, making public that they were investigating one and the other. They had details in terms of a uh, malfunctioning uh, unit that TELUS has since repaired. They're looking into further details around how they can ensure that that doesn't occur again. Uh, but I think as a matter of transparency and due diligence, they just made sure the public was aware of the fact that they're aware and, um, and it's not swept under the carpet. It's a learning opportunity and one that they take seriously. Okay, well, that's interesting because the president of North Island 911 did nothing about that, whoever that is. So I think we need to improve our communication site. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the regional library with uh, Dr. Cote. Uh, thank you. Uh, nothing new to report. We're uh, finished with the strike and uh, moving on with the strategic plan. That's about it. Thank you for Thanks. that. Uh, that brings us to the uh, Chamber of Commerce, Alberti Valley. Anyone from the city or Alberti Valley? Dr. Haggard, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Jack. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was supposed to have their AGM tomorrow during over lunch, but they had to reschedule because business owners could not attend because they have such a shortage of staff. They couldn't even get a quorum, so they rescheduled for a 8 o'clock breakfast meeting. Uh, I can't remember the exact day, but it's beginning of June, first week in June, but we can send you that date if anyone liked to attend. So it's problematic, shortage of staff this year. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Air Quality Council, Dr. Bodner. Thank you. I have to excuse my clock in the background there. Um, 
Anna is still looking for someone to take over her position. She does have a posting out right now. Uh, there's only been one wood stove exchange. However, uh, they've had uh, three calls from three separate First Nations within the ACRD that are planning on overhauling old wood stoves on reserve and replacing them with the heat pumps. The indoor purple monitor is in one of the classrooms in the Alberni Elementary School. And um, there is a journal out called Frontiers in Public Health in which Anna Lewis is named as a co-author. And that's it. Thank you for that. That brings us to the West Coast Aquatic Board, Dr. Steer. Yeah, no meeting and uh, no report. Okay, and uh, AVICC, Dr. Cote. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I did not attend, I think there was a meeting for the uh, ghost gear cleanup and it should be clean up, not clawn up. Um, so I uh, don't really have anything to report out on that. Um, and uh, just the, the UBCM Excellence Award deadline. And I believe that we're applying for one of these awards staff could yeah uh daniel just nodded his thanks yes. great thank you okay just as an update on that i think it's an uh, uh an application for governance in regards to the inclusive governance project that we're averaging okay uh next item is the beaver beaver creek water advisory committee director McNam. Nothing to report where uh, we haven't had a meeting. We will have one shortly. Uh, things are flush and we're uh, proceeding with the care in place uh, project as just as planned. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Next up is the Song Walk in Public Advisory Group. Uh, used to be WeWAC. Yes. So I walk in. I have to get that in my head. Uh, no, uh, no, I haven't got a report on that. A meeting missed about a month ago. So thank you. Uh, yeah, Sawwalk means we are one. So Sawwalk is one and Kin is we. So it's like K-I-N, like Kin. It kind of helps. Uh, next up is the Agricultural Development Committee, Dr. Shannon. Thank you. Um, we had our meeting last week and um, it, it was a really interesting meeting. And it was very, um, it was kind of one of those meetings that you came out of and everybody felt like pretty good and like rejuvenated kind of. Um, if Alex or um, Amy's still here, they could jump in. We, we were talking about the zoning bylaw updates from the agriculture perspective, um, and we had a lot of discussion about it. And Heather Schill gave a presentation about um, the, so in relation to the work she's been doing with the Vancouver Foundation grant that the regional district was successful in getting in um, systems changes. Um, an awesome presentation about a new thinking framework um, that could potentially apply to how we do some of the zoning bylaw updates in regards to agriculture um, and, and gearing it under food production. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that because I asked about the EA directors meeting because she is going to give a presentation to all the EA directors at that one. Um, but I'm really looking forward to everybody hearing it because um, it, it was a really neat way of thinking and um, maybe not, not the words out of the box, but um, kind of coming with an approach of being more educative rather than um, regulatory in a sense. Um, but yeah, she's got a PowerPoint presentation. I'm looking forward to everybody hearing it. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not certain that Amy are, are here, so maybe we can get an update uh, at a later meeting about it in more detail. Um, that brings us to the, oh, I like the new name, the Redfish Restoration Society. Dr. Roberts. Yeah, through the chair, thank you. Um, we had a meeting in the afternoon of the 16th um, to bring the board of directors up to date on everything that's going on. and. Uh, Quite frankly, I don't know how they find the time to do all the stuff that they're doing. Um, pretty impressive organization um, as a society. And uh, they've got a lot of projects on, on uh, restoration going on up and down the island. Um, locally in around Yukulit and Tofino, 
uh, a lot of the uh, First Nations communities are involved um, with cleaning up rivers and uh, they've got a lot of staff involved and also it, it's actually very impressive. And one of the things that uh, Redfish has, has been involved with is the cleanup. And we talked about cleanup on the West Coast and uh, this Saturday, if anybody's out that way or communities on the West Coast, um, at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, um, people are going to be meeting at uh, the junction and uh, getting ready for a back roads cleanup they do on an annual basis. And uh, garbage bags and gloves will be available. And there'll be a little, there'll be some juice and some other things uh, provided as well. So um, if you're available and you're keen and interested, uh, uh, please join in. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a great community effort and uh, would appreciate it. And thank you uh, to the society. They are doing a tremendous job. I'm happy to participate with them. And that's my report. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there any other reports to be given? Seeing none. Uh, I wonder if we can have a motion to receive the member reports. Thank you, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Cole. Okay. Any further comments? Seeing none. All those in favor? All opposed? The motion carried. Great. All right. We don't have any unfinished business. There is no late business. Question period is, oh, Dr. Roberts. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, bring up. Uh... Sorry, um, I just wanted to bring up a situation that uh, has sort of been on my plate for some time, and and that is with regards to fire protection for the area of Port Albion. Okay, before um, you get there, let's have a motion to add this to the agenda. Late, uh, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Director Bodner. All those in favor? All opposed? Motion carried. Please continue. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, there was uh, some time ago a uh, recommendation by um, one of the individuals involved with the Included Fire Department, and that is to have a hydrant placed on um, Sutton Road, uh, which is where the water line comes across and goes out to the Kulithat First Nation. Um, I understand that there was some talk that it was going to be very, very expensive, but having uh, reviewed this a little bit more, uh, one of the other issues that's come up, and I spoke to Heather about this some time ago, is with regards to fire protection for the Port Albion area. Uh, currently, uh, the fire department um, with, with the ACRD offers uh, fire protection in Royal Gray and one of the other communities out there. But Port Albion, where the fire trucks drive right by, is not part of that, included in that protection agreement. So I'd like to have staff look at uh, the potential of uh, including uh, the Port Albion area in fire protection. Would you like to move that? I would. Thank you, do we have a seconder? Thank you, Director Cole. Okay, any further comments or questions? Okay, sounds important. Please, uh, everyone in favor? Everyone opposed? Okay, motion carried, thank you. Okay, that brings us to, now brings us to question period. Uh, this is the last portion for the public. So if there are any comments or questions from the gallery or online, then now would be the time. Okay, uh, Wendy, do we have anything online? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we don't have any questions or comments. Um from uh, there's no attendees there was one but no longer and uh, no nothing received our email address okay thank you very much so now i will read out uh for the close out of our broadcast um we're going to go into in camera which is the closed portion of the meeting and we're only doing it for one reason which i'll read out now this is a motion to close the meeting to the public as per the community charter under section 91a personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, or agent of the regional district, or another position appointed by the regional district. And I will move that to go on camera. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Director Roberts. Any further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? All opposed? Okay, motion carried. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.